My name is Ijazuddin, and I'd just like to welcome you to the third session of the day. And this is on Ukraine. It's tight. Ukraine has become Europe's Afghanistan. Nothing brought this into sharper focus than CNN's correspondent's spontaneous reaction on watching an exodus of fair Ukrainians crowding onto a train. But they can't be refugees, he said. Us. To discuss the causes and the possible outcome of the crisis in Ukraine, we have a distinguished and informed panel of speakers. Marcy Shaw, an associate professor of intellectual history at Yale, is the author of a number of books on post-communism East, East Europe, including Ukrainian Night, The Taste of Ashes, and Caviar and Ashes, which won a national Jewish book award. He would be accompanied by Viktoras Bakhmet Yevas. Viktoras is a philosopher with an interest in the intersection of ethics and religion. He's Lithuanian by origin. Currently, Viktoras' research is focused on the philosophical problem of the concept of forgiveness that was last heard of in South Africa during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The moderator for this session is Rajith Khosla, who is a lawyer by qualification, currently Senior Director of Research, Advocacy and Policy at the International Secretariat of Amnesty International. He has worked with WHO in Geneva, and he was in the Ukraine recently, and so will have a first-hand insight into what is happening. So may I hand over to you, Rajat? and to the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Ajaz, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and great to join you, Marcy, and Victor for this uh, conversation. My journey to, to Ukraine started uh, on the 28th of April, when I uh, traveled to the uh, border town in Poland uh, called Shimzu, uh, and, uh, and, and what is otherwise supposed to be a cultural center called the Ukraine House is now become a transit point for the refugees coming from Ukraine and going into Poland and to other countries in the bordering areas. It's a beautiful establishment, uh, a period building, which uh, is housing anything between 50 to 70 people who are constantly coming through um, through the trains uh, from, from different parts of Ukraine. What then began was a journey into Ukraine via Lviv and then ultimately to Kyiv. And what was very telling was the sheer silence that occupied us as I took that train into uh, Kyiv. The train was almost empty. There was hardly anybody besides us uh, in the passenger bogies that uh, we were traveling into. But the deafening siren was accompanied uh, by the constant air raid sirens uh, that accompanied us uh, through the 14 hours that the journey took us into the, uh, into the city of Kyiv. And I wanted to set that as the point of departure for our conversation. And Marcy, in your book, you talk about the framing of how the political becomes existential. And you start by describing the, the revolution that started uh, from the Megan in 2014 and how the lived realities of individuals got entangled in the revolution that it became and how Megan got to have uh, occupied the significance in the lives of Ukrainians. And I wanted to start by therefore asking you, Marcy and Victorious, to share your own personal reflections on what you see as happening in Ukraine today. May I start with you, Marcy, first, and then we go to you, Victor. Sure. Thank you for the question. I mean, I should first I should first say that I'm of course I'm not a neutral observer. You know, I'm not Ukrainian. I don't come from Ukraine. I'm American. I'm an American Slavicist. But these are my friends and colleagues being slaughtered, you know. And so as, as full disclosure, I can't, I can't look at it with a kind of neutrality 
I mean, in some sense, I feel like the world is divided fundamentally less by race or ethnicity and nationality and more by people we know personally and people we don't know personally. And when they're people you know personally, it's very hard to keep any kind of a distance. Um, what I see, you know, and what I, I hear from my friends who I compulsively check on is an extraordinary kind of solidarity, which was the miracle of the Maidan. I mean, what captured me about the Maidan was that it was not only a political transformation, it was an existential transformation. I was watching people change you know, in front of me. People I had known for years were becoming different people. They were finding some things in themselves they didn't know they had. They were being pushed to the other side of fear in ways they would not have anticipated. You know, they were finding in themselves kind of reservoirs of, of generosity and courage they would not have expected from themselves a few months earlier. In that sense, when, when this war came, I knew that they would fight. I didn't know, I didn't know that whether or not Putin would invade, which was the question that all the journalists wanted to know, you know, in the especially the week or two leading up to the war. You know, what's going to happen? Is he going to invade? Is he going to invade? I had no privileged access. But I did feel certain that if he did, Ukrainians would fight. I had no military knowledge. I couldn't make any military prediction. But I understood that this was now a society that was not going to submit to living under Putin's neo-totalitarianism. And that goes for people whose, whose stronger language is Ukrainian, people whose stronger language is Russian. That goes for people of different generations. You know, I didn't think, and I think I was, my suspicions were right about that, that there was any real demographic in that country who wanted to live under Putin's fascist regime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcy. And indeed, it, it, it was very very heartening to see how people change, but they maintain their generosity even in the face of this uh, attack on the president. Victorious, over to you. How do you see the present situation? Well, I I think, uh, yeah, I, I of course I agree with uh, everything what Marcy said, but I also think it is important to qualify uh, this war uh, because I, I think, uh, especially in the West, but also uh, globally, I can see a lot of people um, uh, questioning uh, the very reasons for this war. And I think it is important to say that this is a colonial war, pure and simple. This is a colonial war par excellence. This is an imperial power trying to colonize a territory which it decided that it's uh, is its own and it's uh, i think all our um, analysis and all our interpretations have to to include this fact if we want to understand the logic and the dynamics of what is taking place both in ukraine at the moment and in russia and i think um, you know this uh maybe a little bit uh, unfortunately this term empire you know as it, as an evil empire and things like that is a little bit overused as a metaphor but uh, i think uh, it is important to stress that uh, russia is an empire an empire in a political sense of the term uh, even its setup at the moment as russian federation is is a collection of uh, of uh, colonies which have been uh, submitted by the so-called titular uh, nation. And so uh, uh, the Russian political mentality, if you will, and Russian definitely state mentality is an imperial uh, mentality. And so what is happening at the moment in Ukraine is just trying to um, take back what they consider to be uh, uh, their own colony. I think uh, there is more to that. And uh, 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 Marcy rightfully said, it's not just an empire, it is a fascist empire. And uh, uh, this qualification of fascism is extremely important. 
What I mean by fascism, and uh, I uh, recommend everyone to read uh, Timothy Snyder's essay today in the, in the New York Times, where he uh, uh, puts it very eloquently. But I think what is important here is that not all uh, colonial powers would colonize uh, 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 foreign territories with, with a blatant attempt to deny uh, identities or even to completely extinguish the, the local population. But fascists, they do. And that's what's happening now in Ukraine. Russia completely denies Ukrainian identity. It has decided for itself that Ukraine is an artificial artificial construct is a complete uh, 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 phantasm and uh, uh, that is also looking from outside is uh, quite uh, difficult and to understand if we disregard that this is a fascist empire which is trying to colonize the territory and i think mm -hmm. it is extremely important uh, because uh, if we disregard that then we can uh, then uh, uh, it might look like some strange regional conflict of of uh, two countries or th things like that but this i i think uh, this uh we have to interpret it as a colonial war thanks victor and, and then let's come back to that point a, a little bit later into the conversation also to 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 look into a bit more deeper in terms of how other countries are looking at it and reacting to it and what you were starting to talk about uh, is in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the ongoing conflict. But if I may turn to something that you both have started talking about already and, 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 and for you to reflect further on what do you think precipitated this? So sure, the colonist ambitions uh, of uh, of, of, of President Putin could could be very well won. Um, and and are there other factors that are interplaying uh, in the sense that this conflict is being precipitated through? Um, and should we have seen this coming? Um, and Marcy, you, uh, in your description of the 2014 re uh, revolution, you talk about how the revolution emerged, what it meant for the changes in lives of people, and how it built through a societal structure, you know, that, that wasn't going to take it uh, sitting down. Um, but, but what happened here? Because from, from any stretch of imagination, this is rather unprecedented if you see from the perspective of that is an outright aggression, a violation of all the standards and norms of international law by a sitting permanent member of the Security Council. Should we have seen this coming? As a historian, my feeling is always that everything is possible and anything is possible. A few days before the invasion, yeah, my, my, my 11 year old son kept asking me, you know, like, mommy, is Putin gonna invade Ukraine? Is Putin gonna invade Ukraine? And I said, I don't know. It's possible, I don't know. I definitely felt like it was a decision in the hands of one man um, that made it especially capricious, who was becoming more and more removed from reality. When I listened to the speech that he gave on Monday, February 21st, telling the Ukrainians, oh, you want, it, you want decommunization? Well, we'll show you decommunization. We'll wipe you off the map. He sounded to me, and I'm not a native Russian speaker, so take this with a grain of salt, but he sounded much more unhinged and deranged, mm. you know, even than he had sounded eight years ago. If you listen to the Crimea speech, you know, it's, it's lies, it's false, it's manipulated, but there's a kind of shrewd cynicism in it. I mean, you feel like you're, you're dealing with a kind of master chess player. The speech he gave a couple days before he invaded, he clearly seemed crazed and capable of anything and the system is so vertical you know that it seemed very conceivable it could be the decision could be in the hands of one man now of course the corollary question to that is why does everybody else go along with it i my my friend slava varkarchuk who's ukrainian rock star and who has been incredibly brave and just incredibly good and trying to go around the country and and 
give people hope, you know, and shore up morale and very committed. He, he called a couple days before the invasion. I don't think he'd mind my sharing this. And I said, Slava, how, what's the atmosphere like in Kiev? How does it feel now? And he said, well, Marcy, imagine some kind of synthesis between how it must have felt to be in Florida in October 1961 during the Cuban Missile Crisis, where nobody is quite sure if a nuclear war is about to begin, and how it must have felt to be in Central Europe between the Munich Conference of 1938 and the invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939. He said, Kiev now feels like something like a combination of those atmospheres. Yeah, um, indeed. Um, Victor? Well, I, I have to remind uh, everyone that uh, Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014, eight years ago. Uh, it was a, a, a military invasion. It was an annexation of a large part of uh, Ukraine, and there was a military conflict and in another part of Ukraine in Donbass for the uh, last eight years. And there was a ceasefire only because Ukraine submitted to the pressure uh, from mainly France and Germany. It was a very uneasy truce, although the, there were military conflict was going on, but Russia invaded not in 2022 or February 24th, but uh, in 2014. But I, I also have to remind everyone that it was not the first invasion by uh, Russia uh, in recent history. In 2008, uh, Russia invaded Georgia. And uh, uh, Georgia, uh, and even now, at, at the moment, as we speak, Russian uh, military units are in, uh, uh, in parts of Georgia. Uh, uh, so uh, to say that uh, uh, we haven't seen this coming uh, is to say that we have not been looking. We have mm -hmm. not been observing this region of the world. That it's as simple as that. For me, as a Eastern European, as someone who is uh, who lives in this region, is it is uh, also I have to admit a little bit tiresome because uh, uh, we are as Eastern Europeans used to be accused of, Rus of, of being Russophobes and 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 whatnot in the West. Uh, mm -hmm. Although the only thing we have been trying to say all this time since basically the second uh, uh, Chechen war that Russia is a dangerous country, dangerous to its neighbors, and that it completely disregards human rights and, and uh, uh, both among its citizens, but also abroad. You know, Russia was killing uh, uh, and using chemical weapons in United Kingdom uh, a few years ago. And uh, so it's it, 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 to say that we're surprised by by what Russia is doing now is to say that, uh, you know, we, we have not been watching at all. Mm -hmm. um, in that sense, I'm not surprised. I think what, uh, uh, what of course, everyone is discussing in, uh, is that the scale of the invasion mm -hmm. and, of course, the, the scale of the brutalities, uh, mm -hmm. the crimes uh, against humanity and the war crimes, which have been documented, they are now in the thousands, uh, in, uh, and the war has been uh, uh, going on not even for three months. This is uh, unprecedented, even uh, looking global in, in the last uh, 100 years. I think Marcy will correct me if I'm wrong, but that I think is quite surprising because it shows a complete disregard for any norms, you know, when to start bombing Kiev when you know that uh, uh, Secretary General of United Nations is visiting Kiev, and to do that blatantly is, is just to show that we really do not care about anything, about anything. So in that sense, uh, of course, it is a little bit surprising, but I have to say even more surprising is even after all of this, after the uh, Bucha massacres, after all this, uh, complete this after blocking uh, uh, Ukrainian ports and basically causing food crisis in Africa, that uh, w some Western powers, and here I have to mention France and Germany and Italy, they still think how to save, how to help uh, save uh, Putin's face. 
that is uh, that is really surprising to me. I mean, uh, I really try to understand the logic of it, and I, I and I can't. No, it is it is indeed logic defying, and uh, and you do raise an important point, which is about the scale of violations that we are talking about. When I was there, and in a conversation with the prosecutor general, we were told at at that point in time, which is already two weeks ago, that there was something in the tune of 9,600 alleged violations that they were investigating, um, and which is which is a phenomenal number to be talking about. And I would like to come back to that in a moment when uh, and, and, and uh, discuss with you further the idea of justice and then the idea of forgiveness and what, what those might mean within the context of the present conflict. But I wanted to turn to another issue. Um, and you mentioned Bucha and the massacre in Bucha um, that happened. And I did visit Bucha and I did visit Bodianka as well, two towns at the outskirts of uh, Kiev. And as, as those of you who know, uh, those, these two towns were occupied by Russian forces for a period of time. The kind of indiscriminate attack uh, that we witness in Bodianka is, uh, is, is pretty phenomenal. We are looking at over a hundred housing units buildings being completely destroyed. And one could only imagine the kind of payloads that they must be dropping at those establishments and what it means. But what I wanted to focus on is also the survivors, the victims of this conflict. And we spoke to a number of them uh, while I was there, and we spoke to uh, a group of men who used to live in those establishments that they were there and whose houses has been blown apart and who lost family members. As, uh, as, as a consequent uh, of this conflict, you know, some lost five, some lost three, some two, um, but everybody had lost family members uh, in those uh, attacks. And then there was, uh, there was, you know, incidents in Bucha, which were essentially extrajudicial executions, where men were essentially uh, dragged down to the square and shot at point blank range. Um, by the Russian forces, and there is very clear evidence to demonstrate who made these attacks and what constituted to this. And as you look at these lives that have been completely ripped apart, and families of individuals who who just don't know what's happening and who just don't know what will happen to them in the future because the conflict is still going on, one does struggle to understand what would justice look like? What would an idea of justice for these victims that are looking completely with blank eyes into their, you know, what used to be their houses once, um, and reflecting upon what future might behold for them? And I wanted to turn to you and both of you, uh, uh, you know, uh, as authors have talked about these issues in different contexts, is how do you see justice for these ordinary Ukrainians beyond the political theater uh, that will happen eventually when it will happen? What would a meaningful justice approach look like? And is forgiveness even a possibility? Marcy, do you want to go on first? Um, yeah, no, I've been thinking about that and I've, I've talked to some international lawyers and. I suppose the thing that's so wrenching that we all see is that justice, if it occurs, always comes too late. It's a little bit like Hegel's Owl of Minerva. You know, it always comes too late. I was thinking a lot about, for instance, Slavenko Dracolich's wonderful book about the, the war criminals from the Yugoslav Wars of Epic Cleansing. You know, she's a Croatian writer. You know, after the war, she went and she listened to these trials in The Hague and she wrote this book. Um, called They Would Never Hurt a Fly with profiles and biographical profiles trying to understand how these people found themselves in this situation. And you know, those guys, you know, Milosevic and his people, you know, they were tried in The Hague, but only after it was all over. It always comes too late. You know, and I don't, 
I don't think in some sense there can ever be adequate justice once you've you've destroyed people's lives, that you've taken their children, you've taken their parents. Those children are going to be traumatized, you know, forever. Like there's no there's no compensation, you know, that can possibly be adequate. And the frustration then is that why, you know, at this point in human history are we unable to stop things in, in real time, you know, many people are asking me about the Nuremberg trials. People are asking me because I'm a historian and normally I work on the 20th century, not on the 21st century. How is this different from the Second World War? And I, I said, we're it, it, internet. We're watching it in real time. Like imagine it were 1942 and you could pull up one screen and, and get a speech by Churchill, you know, live streamed and another screen and, you know, tab and get a speech by Hitler live streamed and pull up a third tab and you can get your live stream into the gas chambers. You know, how would that have changed what's going on? People believed at that time that the truth would save them, that if people only knew that would be the thing that would save them. And we're watching it all in real time or extremely close to real time. We know what's happening. We know it's an unprovoked invasion. You know, we have more than enough detailed graphic information, you know, and, and we're, we're watching you know, children's hospitals be bombed and kindergartens and maternity wards and children buried under rubble. We're watching it in real time. Why are we so, why are we so powerless in real time? You know, and if, we can talk about justice coming, but it seems like it's only coming like Owl, Hegel's Owl of Minerva. It's coming too late. It's coming when it's over. And, and, and I, the, what I'm tearing my hair about is why can't we make it stop now? Yeah, I, I know, absolutely. And I have to say, um, and that was coming into our conversation today and while we were in Ukraine, one of the things that I was particularly taken aback by how much of this war is fought both on the front lines in the south and the east of the country, but also um, on, on social media, the level of propaganda. And if you look at some of the telegram channels that are being used uh, to, 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 to parade uh, the graphic images of, of the horrors of the war, it is very stunning. But indeed, mm -hmm. what does that mean in terms of our inability to stop what is going on, but also to develop any sense of justice. Victor, what do you make of it? Yes, I think, uh, you know, uh, in, in situations like that, um, uh, the concept of uh, restorative justice is uh, completely futile. It does not help here. And uh, because we can't restore what's been taken uh, from these people, human lives, they ca they cannot be restored. And in, in in that sense, of course, it's it's quite difficult to speak about uh, justice in, in in that sense. But uh, I think uh, on a, on a political level, it is uh, extremely important that those who have committed those crimes are punished not because the, it will uh, restore uh, you know a previous uh, state or we will we will get back so to speak to point zero but uh, 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 for future generations because it will uh, it will uh, give us all uh, a sense that the, we do not accept those things that they are not they cannot be justified they we cannot uh, let them happen in, not you know ontologically so to speak of course they are happening mm -hmm. as Mark pointed out but we do not accept them on a on the level of principle and uh, those who have perpetrated those crimes all of them have to be punished have to be punished and that there is uh, this sense of justice not in the sense of restoration, but in the sense of uh, establishing and reaffirming the principles according to which we organize our uh, our communal living, our societies. And on a purely human level, of course, you can say that this does not help. You know, this does not help the residents of Bucha that some 
uh, mm -hmm. Russian soldiers or even Putin will, will stand trial. This does not bring them their loved ones. Uh, uh, of course, but I think there is something that uh, these people, at least most of them have, is that they know that their cause is right and they know what they are fighting for. And this is extremely important, I think, because this is the basis for hope. And so it's not, then it's a question not about justice, but that those who have suffered, that all this suffering was not in vain. And that not in vain is that if Ukrainians will prevail and will will create a country that they can be proud of and that those who 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 died for it that they they did not die in vain and so here i would try to speak of of uh, more of uh, in terms of hope rather than uh, justice and and uh, and the your final uh, point about uh, forgiveness is forgiveness possible i think Again, on the, on the level of principle, forgiveness is always possible. Is always possible, and uh, you know, at least in the Western culture, we we even talk about our duty to forgive. So we uh, uh, there is this tradition of what to to think that it is not only possible to forgive, but we have to strive towards forgiveness. We have to try to forgive. It is our moral duty. Uh, so, of course, it is possible, and uh, even uh, uh, Ukrainians speak about that. But there is, I think, uh, a very important aspect here is that it is too early to speak about it. It is too early to speak about it because the crime hasn't finished yet. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? It's just that it's, it's not the time of forgiveness. Now the time is that we have to stop this crime, which is taking place at the moment in Ukraine. And so I think uh, I follow, and of course I know quite a lot of uh, people in uh, uh, democratic Russian opposition. And I think at least some of them, I'm, of course I'm not generalizing and uh, it's, it's vast and varied, but uh, at least some of them, I think they exhibit this uh, lack of sensitivity when they start speaking about uh, about forgiveness or about future friendship of Russians and Ukrainians or how how we gonna construct our relations when this is all is finished but I think it is lack of sensitivity because for Ukrainians it's it, this hypothetical is just um, is, is is not just not right, but it's almost offensive because the crime is taking place now. So our old thoughts and energies should be spent not about thinking how Ukrainians will forgive us or, or them or whoever, but about how to stop the suffering. And, and then the question of forgiveness, reconciliation and things like that will come, but their turn will come. But I, I don't think it is the time yet. Mm. No, uh, well said, uh, Victor, and I think, uh, I think while, while we are still struggling to make sense of what is going on and with, with little, little hope of an end in sight um, for this war, one, one is quite struck with with how resilient the common person is in sight of the levels of adversity that they are confronted with. And I guess before we come to forgiveness, we need to start, as, as Eli Wiesel uh, once said, by listening to each other and by trying to understand what is going on. Um, for the few minutes that remain for our conversation, I, I want to, uh, to, to talk to you bit about the reaction to the war by those in the neighboring countries uh, to Ukraine, but also in the rest of the world, in South Asia, for instance. And 
And it has been a very telling experience uh, for, for, for geopolitical thinkers, for foreign policy experts and so on, um, on the reactions that came out. And there has been levels of generosity that one has seen within Europe, North America, uh, that, is, that is very heartening. But at the same time, those levels of generosity has been questioned as symbolic of double standards, because where was that generosity when we did see, uh, not too far back in history, refugee flows coming in and, and which were labeled as catastrophic uh, by, by, the, by the same European governments. That being one part of the picture. Another part of the picture is how governments, whether they are in South Asia or in Africa, have reacted in the multilateral spaces to the Russian aggression. Many, if not, have abstained from voting on the resolutions calling in, whether it is the calling out the aggression about humanitarian corridors, about atrocities, um, have actually supported in some cases those things. And you see the voting records on some of these things, it's, it's very perplexing to understand what is going on. Of course, one is not naive. There is a lot of Russian influence in a number of countries that we are talking about and the legacies of the non-aligned movement and so on. But I wanted to have both your take on it on, on to how you see that, that, you know, generosity, double standards at one end, but a complete hands off, if not support to the aggression in on the other. Marcy, would you want to start us off? Um, yeah, well, let me let me try to speak about you know, what I, I have some sense of, because I, I don't have a good enough sense of what's happening through a lot of the rest of the world. I can say that you know, spending a lot of time talking to the American media now has been very, very different from what I experienced eight years ago during the Maidan. I was spending a lot more time, and not just me, I'm kind of, I'm going to speak on behalf of all of us kind of American Slavicists who play the role of cultural mediators and translators and trying to help people understand one another across these borders. I spent a lot more time eight years ago trying to explain that it was not, there was the Maidan was a real revolution, that it was not a neo-fascist coup, that these were not all radical right-wing nationalists who were going to go on to kill all the Jews and Russian speakers. I didn't feel like I was doing that this time. I didn't, you know, eight years later, having gone through the experience of Trump, American journalists understood post-truth a lot better. They understood Putin a lot better. The story about denazification, I don't think was getting any real traction outside extremely marginal groups anywhere outside of Russia, at least anywhere that I experienced. You know, I thought the questions I was getting from journalists were much better. They were much more sophisticated. They were much more considered. You know, I think in general, the press coverage has been very good. I think there was a very good understanding of the fact that this was a totally unprovoked invasion, kind of grotesque, right in front of our eyes for absolutely no reason whatsoever. And there were there were people who also understood that, oh, the story about denazification is like the story about QAnon, you know, and in fact, both those stories come out of the very same St. Petersburg troll factory that Peter Pomerantsev has written about. And literally, they were spun from the same people, you know, the same trolls being employed nine to five in the same corporate office in St. Petersburg. And Americans have now seen people go down that rabbit hole of QAnon. They've seen families broken up, you know, by people who, you know, split on that, on the Trump issue, you know, and they have some sense now of how that kind of manipulation and internet manipulation might be working in Russia. So I felt like there was a lot of questions about, can you get into the Russian informational space? Do Russians really believe this? But I didn't feel like I had to spend very much time at all explaining to anybody that, you know, there was not actually a Nazi, you know, a Nazi regime going on in Kiev and that they were not massacring the native Russian speakers. And in fact, you know, the president was a Jew who himself is a native Russian speaker who has given incredibly well-pitched and 
heartbreakingly wrenching, you know, speeches and addresses in Russian to Russian soldiers, you know, and to Russian families. And so I feel like the understanding has generally been good among politicians, among journalists, among students. I've also been very moved. I mean, I'm in a kind of privileged position because I get to teach students from all over the world. Um, I've gotten, I got an email from a student from Mexico I taught several years ago who had been in a seminar on Arendt with a student from, a student from India, a student from Russia, one from Ukraine. He read about Ukraine in my seminar, you know, and he wrote to me and he's like, Marcy, we've been out of touch for several years, but I want you to know that I'm now in Berlin and I'm driving medical supplies to the Ukrainian border every week. I, I got an email from a, a young man in Argentina who I'd never met, but who had read the Ukrainian Night and earlier written to me about, you know, how interesting he found Ukraine and how he liked the book. And he wrote to me after the invasion and said, Dear Professor Shore, I'm so sorry to bother you. I know you must have no time at all, but I keep thinking about those people in the book. And and could you just tell me, like, is, is Misha Martinenko okay? And what about his little sister? You know, she must be 18 years old now. And, and this is a young man in Argentina. Argentina, on the other side of the world, who's never been to Ukraine, who just read this book, but who is, you know, reading and who is thinking. You know, and I've been, I've been moved by my students who had nothing previously to do with this part of the world, who have volunteered, who have raised money. Uh, and so I can't, like, I can't complain about that. I also think that for a lot of Americans, having come a hair's breadth from our own fascist coup, you know, just a little over a year earlier, gave us some understanding of how easily that that could happen. And one analogy I used is that, okay, imagine January 6th had gone the other way, which it very well might have gone the other way, you know, and we were living under a Trumpist fascist dictatorship, you know, and Trump decides that making America great again, you know, means, you know, going and invading Canada. And while Canada is also a bilingual country and lots of people speak English there, Toronto is an English speaking city, you know, what if the American army under Trump showed up and started shelling Toronto and bombing kindergartens? You know, well, lots of people have family on both sides of the border. Lots of people in Washington have cousins in Philadelphia. They're also native English speakers. Gee, why would they have a problem with that? Why wouldn't they be part, want to part, be part of this great America? They're all English speakers too. And I think that, I think having gone through that experience and having been so close, you know, to to our own country slipping into that neo totalitarianism has given Americans some greater level of empathy for what's happening in Ukraine. Thanks, thanks very much, Marcy. Uh, Victor? Yeah, I also maybe can I'm not an expert in this, but maybe I can share a few impressions. You know, if if we speak about the region in which I live, Lithuania and the Baltic states, I think here yeah, it's just uh, uh, for us it's very simple. It uh, Ukraine is is uh, fighting our war, uh, as simple as that. And so, the, uh, uh, and it uh, transpires to all levels of society to. Uh, political elites, no matter left or right, of course there are some voices, uh, but they are really marginal. But I think there is a broad consensus that Ukraine is fighting a, a, not just a just war, but also it's defending us from uh, uh, an imperial power which uh, is just trying to. And if they, if if Russia prevails there, then we'll be next in line. Uh, it's as simple as that. Also, I think maybe with some e exceptions, but broadly, I think the same sentiment applies to all the uh, countries of so-called Central Eastern Europe, all those who were once behind the Iron Curtain, who uh, have uh, in living memory experience of, of, uh, uh, of uh, living in one form or another under the rule of, from Moscow. Of course, Hungary is, is, is an obvious exception to that, but uh, all the others are more or less uh, clear of what's taking place in, in Ukraine and that we have to do everything that is in, is in our power that Russia does not win, not only for Ukraine, but also for, for the whole region. Uh, I think uh, uh, if we talk about the United States, I think the, their, their, their reaction is, I would call it evolving. I think 
uh, although in the in the beginning uh, United States and Washington were sharing intelligence with Ukrainians but they were quite reluctant to help uh, militarily I think there was some doubt if Ukraine will be able to defend uh, itself but I think after the first few days when it became clear that Ukrainians are fighting they're not escaping I think uh, the the admirable uh, stance of, of the president of Ukraine uh, helped in that regard but also uh, the whole of the nation and I think then uh, uh, United States and United Kingdom uh, became quite active in supporting both financially and militarily uh, Ukraine and I think uh, that uh, that is a very positive development what is quite uh, Disappointing is, uh, I would call, uh, uh, a slow and uh, um, tentative reaction of the uh, big powers in the EU, France and Germany, first and foremost, uh, Italy to some extent. And uh, I think they, uh, they're sending mixed uh, signals. I'm talking here, of course, of the political elites, because uh, all the polls show that... Uh, populations in, in these countries are in favor of helping Ukraine much more than their governments do at the moment. Mm -hmm. But their governments are sending quite mixed uh, signals, uh, sometimes saying that you, uh, we should be helping Ukraine and actually indeed saying that we are helping and then it turns out that they don't. And uh, keeping some back channels with uh, talking to Moscow, uh, finding for some reason a priority to save Putin's face and, and, and things like that. And that is quite disconcerting. Uh, and I think it should be disconcerting globally because uh, uh, this sets a very worrying precedent. If you can invade any country, commit war crimes, commit crimes against humanity, and uh, countries like France and Germany will be... Uh, uh, worried how to save the aggressor's face. Mm. I think all um, so-called lesser or smaller countries in the world should should be worried. And I, I in Southeast Asia, in Africa, and and uh, and elsewhere. So I think this is. Uh, I, I'm not sure if the leaders of those countries understand that uh, uh, these things will stay in 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 the memories that the world is observing this and i think they 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 making a grave mistake uh, hopefully this will uh, this will change if i would have to characterize in 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 one sentence uh, what's taking place i would say that in eastern europe and and the uh, united states of america see as their priority for ukraine to win while i think uh, countries like Germany or France, they want the, uh, the, the war to end. And these goals are not uh, the same. Uh, <coughs> they are not the same. And I think here there is some uh, 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 some, di some differences. Uh, but mm -hmm. I, I'm, I would like to stress that I think that all the world who cares about the rule of law, all the world uh, everyone in the world who cares about uh, uh, human rights, uh, about international law, I think they should insist uh, that Ukraine has to win. That it, the, there can't be uh, any frozen conflict of the sorts mm -hmm. that we already have in Georgia, that we had in Ukraine since 2014, because this only encourages the aggressor. I think uh, we have to be very, very clear uh, about it. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that picture. We, we're almost out of time, but uh, but I do I think want you, us to, wanted to, uh, to add something. Uh, yes, uh, and I was going to come to that as well. But I, what I wanted to say was, uh, um, and then to maybe have a, a final minute of reflection from both of you. If uh, and I know future is hard to predict, and and we don't know what's happening. But if I may ask you for a brief reflection on what would give you hope from where you are sitting right now. Marcy, to you first, and then we end with you, Victor. Thank you, Marcy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
Yes, finally, first I, I would say that I completely agree with Victor. We're not in a saving face situation. I mean, we're dealing with a sociopath. We're not dealing with a rational actor. Political scientists like to assume that people will act rationally. I mean, historians know that history is just drenched with examples of people acting irrationally. You know, I, we've watched Putin level Grozny, level Aleppo, you know, now Kharkiv and Mariupol. I think he... It, it has to be decisive. He has to be gone. That regime has to fall. Ukraine has to win decisively. It's not a let's negotiate type of situation. Um, what gives me hope um, and what I constantly say to my children um, who are who know entirely too much about what's going on and have been to Ukraine and know our friends and students there, what I try to get them to focus on are the thousands, if not millions of people who have stepped up to help. You know, people like the young man in Argentina and my student in Mexico, you know, and this this young man that I, I know in New Haven who flew to Poland from one day to the next to help translate and evacuate pediatric cancer patients. All of these people around the world, some of whom all the pediatric oncologists who have come to help those evacuated kids and place them in hospitals. What I try to tell my kids is that I really think there are more good people than bad people. You know, I really think the number of people who are trying to help save people is greater than the number of people who are slaughtering and torturing people. Unfortunately, that handful of psychopathic sadists like Putin seems to be holding the rest of us hostage. But what gives me hope is I think that there is so much. There's so many people trying to do good in the world that I like to think we're going to find a way to let that prevail, ultimately. Thanks a lot, Marcy. Uh, Victor? Well, I, I, I don't deal in hope. I'm trying always to, <laughs> to talk in plans, so <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry about that. But I think if we talk about, about this particular conflict, I, um, I apply the formula which uh, uh, of one... Uh, uh, a Russian opposition figure. He, he says that Ukraine has already won, it's just that Russia hasn't lost yet. And I think uh, uh, that's the situation at the moment. I think Ukraine already has won in on a broader scale. And so the, the question is now the terms of, of, of Russia's loss. And so in that sense, I think it's quite hopeful. But if we, spoke, if we speak broader, and we should speak broader beyond uh, this conflict, I think the question is uh, that I would like to end with what I started. I think the problem is that Russia is still an empire. We had in 20th century, we had a few projects of de-imperialization. We had some voluntary ones like United Kingdom and France after they lost heavily some colonial wars and they, they understood that this is not the way. And we had some, uh, uh, some de-imperialization projects which were done against the world, that's Germany and Japan. So we have some uh, some precedents in history how to de-imperialize a state. Russia has never been de-imperialized, and I think that's one of the mistakes. So we have to apply all the colonial uh, uh, experiences and colonial studies and post-colonial studies and think about Russia in those terms. And I think that that's a very, very fruitful area, both of research, but also of political practices. Thank you so much, uh, Victor and Marcy. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and thank you for joining uh, for this uh, very, very thought-provoking conversation. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You were listening to a discussion <coughs> on the great night, and it was um, moderated by Rajat brilliantly, and it had two eminent speakers each of whom has provided very moving insights into the current situation in Ukraine. Marci, if I may just for a second um, pick up on something which was in your book, A Taste of Ashes, where you talked about, you said nearly a quarter century after the fall of communism, the Ukrainian revolution illuminated anew the border between modernity and post-modernity. Mm -hmm. And you've identified that post-modernity began with the relinquishing of attempts to replace God not only God was dead, but moreover, there was no one and nothing to replace it. Mm. It reminded me of G.K. Chesterton's famous remark that when man ceases to believe in God, the danger is not that he will believe in nothing, but that he will believe in anything. <laughs> and if I may, you <laughs> cautioned uh, Marcy about uh, totalitarianism, and there are numerous examples, 
Trump notwithstanding. Mm -hmm. um, and if I may um, just refer, Victor, to your assertion and insistence that the Russian position at the moment is one of a revival, a renaissance, if you like, of imperialism. The Russians never stopped being an empire. It is just that they mm -hmm. camouflage their ambitions more subtly. Um, you've uh, mentioned that empire as such is back. And I'm reminded of a, a remark that was made by Chairman Mao Zedong. Andre Monroe, at that time, the French cultural minister, w went to Beijing and he asked uh, Chairman Mao, do you see yourself as the last of the Chinese emperors? To which Mao Zedong replied, but of course, and one is tempted to um, suggest that if one were to ask Vladimir Putin, do you see yourself mm -hmm. as the next uh, revival of the Tsars? He'd certainly mm -hmm. reply, but of course, mm -hmm. I am the new Tsar. Mm -hmm. And it is this which frightens all countries that uh, regardless of their size, regardless of their political beliefs, etc., but which believe in the supremacy of law in the um, foundations of sovereignty and who are, whether they're strong or weak, it doesn't matter. What matters is they exist and they have the right to exist. And that is really what is being flouted at the moment with this, uh, um, this um, invasion. One is tempted to wonder whether the Russians will retreat as they did in Afghanistan and leave Ukraine and return to Russia as they had to do then. But thank you all, all three of you for a very stimulating discussion. And uh, on behalf of the uh, Hushan Singh Literary Festival, let me thank you and the listeners for uh, participating in this extremely uh, timely and thought provoking discussion. Thank you. Thank you. We've had a most stimulating series of presentations being made today, and um, I'm sure that all of you will join me in thanking the Khushwan Singh Litfest management, but particularly Rahul Singh and Nilifa Bill Moria, who performed yet another um, miracle of technology and uh, cooperation across the world between countries, friends, and um, persons who share a common ideal, and that was that crossing boundaries is really the way forward. I'll just introduce a few of these that we will be, uh, that will be, that will be presented. The first will be the author, Jeffrey Archer, with, who will be interviewed by Mihir Bose, and it is on his book, Over My Dead Body. It's his new thriller, and uh, it um, uh, deals with continents and ocean liners. The second session will be by Wendy Doniger with Arshia Sattar, and it is an American girl in India, and it's her autobiography as a younger Wendy falling in love with India. The third session will be by Anjum Altaf and Amit Basol with Raza Mead as the moderator, and they'll be talking about Ghalib. And this section, session will bring together from both sides of the border lovers of Mirza Ghalib, a favorite of Khushwan Singh, of anyone to whom love is the only four-lettered word that matters in life. The conclusion will be a thank you session by Rahul Singh, in which he'll be winding down with gratitude and shaking hands across borders. We look forward to tomorrow's session. Please join us then.